All right, well, let's uh, begin by reading the text we're going to be looking at, uh, Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 20. Acts 19, verses 11 through 20. Beginning in verse 11, Luke writes, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches, seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices, and many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Now this morning, remember, we saw uh, the work at Ephesus um, gaining momentum. Uh, the first time Paul came on his second missionary journey, there was moderate uh, but important success or progress. He, along with Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos, has succeeded in breaking some very hard ground. Okay, it was a humble beginning to what was about to become a great outpouring of God's Spirit. Now that he was back on his third journey, the Spirit really began to move things forward. We saw this morning how the Lord began by converting 12 disciples of John the Baptist they experienced uh, what we might call a, um, a mini Pentecost. Um, the Lord not only gave them His Spirit, but also the signs that they had received the Spirit to those around them. Remember, they spoke in languages that they didn't understand. And in those languages were declaring the wonderful works of God. Uh, I didn't mention this this morning, but some speculate that these men may have actually formed the leadership of the Ephesian church and were perhaps among those Paul will later call together to warn before he goes uh, to Jerusalem. Now, these were just the first fruits of this movement. Uh, when the Jews began to reject Jesus, he moved the disciples to the school of Tyrannus, where he continued to minister for two more years with the result that the gospel spread throughout all of Asia. Um, you know, one thing I think we need to see here is this, that um, I think historically we know that there's always a beginning, you know, to any revival, and those beginnings are usually quite small, you know, before the Lord causes them basically to steamroll. And we've been reminded again and again that we should never despise the day of small things. I, I remember the, the New York revival began with just a prayer meeting where there were some individuals who believed that the, that the Lord would have them get together and, and pray that, um, that He might do something great in New York. And uh, as they continued to pray, more people started gathering for that uh, prayer meeting until there were hundreds of people praying. And eventually the Lord did bring great revival. Even, you know, the whole uh, kingdom of heaven begins very small, as Jesus reminds us, as a mustard seed. Jesus began with 12 disciples, and yet look at how far the gospel has gone since then. The Lord is still able to do great things today, but those things begin, again, very small. Now, this evening, I want us to consider what the Lord did to fuel this fire. Um, 
by the miracles that he did through Paul, by distinguishing those miracles from false miracles, and by using these events to bring many people to Jesus, essentially by striking fear in their hearts, by showing them that God really was in their midst. So first of all, we see the miracles that he did through Paul in verses 11 and 12. Luke writes, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. As Paul continued to minister the gospel, the Lord continued to confirm his message through miraculous signs. And in this case, unusually powerful ones. You know, we're reminded that our Lord Jesus said to his disciples uh, earlier in John uh, chapter 4, actually, I want to say was chapter 14, verse 12. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. And now we, we, we've seen that after Jesus ascended and poured out his Holy Spirit, uh, that greater works were actually being accomplished. Remember back in Acts chapter 5, how the Jews in Jerusalem saw what, what the Lord was doing through his apostles and carried their sick out into the streets, laying them on cots and on pallets so that Peter, as he walked by, that his shadow might by actually fall on them and heal them. Well, we see here again the Lord doing something uh, greater. Uh, you know, we know that uh, in the days of our Lord Jesus, there was a woman who had the hemorrhage and she reached out to touch the hem of his garment. She touched it and was healed because she believed. Here we see handkerchiefs or, uh, and again, there's a variety of opinions as to what this might be. Um, but probably the, the clause that, that Paul was using maybe to uh, wipe the sweat off of his face as he was working and aprons, which literally means those aprons that the craftsmen would use, were, were being taken from Paul uh, and laid on those who were sick and demon-possessed and they were immediately healed. Now again, these miracles not only showed uh, again, God's grace and God's mercy. Because remember, most of the miracles that were done by Jesus and his apostles, not, not all of them, but most of them, were acts of, of mercy towards those who received them. Uh, acts of healing or, again, deliverance uh, from demon possession to give those who received them a reason to honor the Lord, to love him, to praise him, but they also were used by the Lord to prove that Paul was his messenger and that they should listen to the message that he was bringing, which is why the Lord gave Paul the power to do these things. Now, that's how the Lord vindicated his word. That's how he showed that the messenger was his in those days. And we've noted before that miracles have ceased today and the Lord no longer gives us the power to do these things, and the reason he doesn't is because he doesn't have to keep on proving that what he has said before actually is his message. He has done that once and for all. So today, if we want to demonstrate that the message actually comes from God, then we need to do it in uh, various other ways. And I thought this might be a good, uh, way, a good time to sort of review perhaps one of the more important ar um, arguments as to why we believe the Bible to be the Word of God. We need to point to the miracles that He has already done. And how do we do that? Well, they are recorded for us in the Bible. Remember the argument that R.C. Sproul gave us when we were going through, you know, reasons, um, reasons for faith or uh, defending your faith? He says, if we grant that the Bible is at least generally reliable history, we, we look in it and we see that it records not just miracles, but eyewitness accounts of miracles from more than one, from actually several eyewitnesses. These several eyewitness accounts prove that the miracles took place. 
the miracles prove that Jesus is a true prophet. And Jesus, as a true prophet, tells us that the Bible is God's word, and therefore the message is true. Now, don't forget, too, that R.C. said that we need to be able to demonstrate from general revelation first that God exists before we go into this argument because many people today, especially uh, the, the liberal critical scholars, would discount the Bible as being the Word of God because it records miracles. But if we can show that first uh, a supernatural being exists, then it's, it's obviously not going to be outside of the realm of possibility that there would be these miracles. So we first prove that God exists. I'm not going to go through those arguments tonight, but I would just encourage you again to review the arguments that we've seen because I would guess that we've probably all let them slip a bit out of our minds. So the first thing that we need to do, of course, prove God exists and then look at the Bible as, as eyewitness accounts of these miracles that prove Jesus is who he said he was and he says the Bible is his word. Secondly, there is our personal testimony, how this message of the gospel has changed our lives. Remember what Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And I would say not just for each other as members of the body of Christ, so that's primary, but that we would show it by our love for other people. Now, that is the reason why it is so important that we are growing into the image of Christ. I mean, look, look at his life and how it was basically a, a non-ending series of acts of love towards others. That was one of the things that set him apart, and that's what sets apart true believers. Remember that people look at us and they judge Jesus by what they see in us. And that's one of the reasons why many people have turned away from the church is because they look at people in the church and they say, hey, these Christians are no different than I am. So why should I listen to them? But when they see a supernatural love, that is convincing. So we need to remember Jesus' reputation depends on it. So we need to point to the eyewitness accounts to prove it. We need to be able to show the world that it really does make a difference in, in our lives. That's evidence as well. We call that our witness, our personal testimony uh, and witness. But then the third thing is the most compelling, which is something we can't give, but only the Spirit of God gives, and He does as we share the gospel. And that is when He opens their eyes, right? That is the ultimate proof, because not only will that convince them that the Bible is true, but seeing this truth in the way that they will see it, they won't be able to stop themselves from actually coming to Jesus because they won't want to. They will trust Him and follow Him from the heart. So we may not be able to do miracles as the Apostle Paul did to prove the message, but that doesn't mean we can't prove that the gospel is from God. Again, remember the, the apologetic series. But now the Lord also did something else to prove that Paul's message was actually from him. He allowed those who didn't know him to attempt to do the same thing and to fail miserably. Okay, we read in verses 13 and 14. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who, were from, who, who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. Now, the miracles that Paul had done were drawing attention to the message, but they also drew the attention of some Jewish exorcists. Now, Josephus tells us something about these men, that they essentially claim to have a, a, a long lineage of, of practice as far back as, as Solomon, that their forefathers created charms to cure diseases and to drive out demons. At least that's the story they used to lend credibility to their profession. 
In Paul's days, these exorcists were essentially vagabonds. You know, they were people who traveled from town to town, and they made a living by doing magic tricks. Uh, Jesus might have had them in mind when he said to the Jews on one occasion, if I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? There, there were Jewish exorcists. Now, when these heard or perhaps saw what Paul was able to do and, again, how even just, just these articles of cloth taken from him, laid on the demon-possessed, were, were able to deliver them, they thought this was a great way to make money. I mean, what a, what a wonderful trick to be able to name the name of Jesus over a demon-possessed person and deliver them. So, a mo new money-making scheme. And so, they attempted to command an evil spirit using Jesus' name. I adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Uh, but we know they weren't expecting, you know, what happened next, where Luke writes, the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus. And I know about Paul, but who are you? And the result, as we know, wasn't too pretty. Verse 16, and the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And again, thinking about that, I'm sure that that was a, a, you know, a very difficult situation for those seven men, but it's somewhat humorous when you think about it. This one man was able to overcome them in such a way. Now, we know from Scripture that those who are possessed have often incredible strength. Remember the man with the legion uh, who was able to break chains and to shatter the shackles uh, that they tried to use to bind him. And he apparently grew in strength to the point where no one was able to subdue him, so they didn't go by where he was. They tried to avoid that road. In this case, just one man possessed by a demon was able to overcome seven men uh, to a rather embarrassing <laughs> degree. Now, the problem, of course, is that these exorcists did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. They had not trusted Him as their Savior or submitted to Him as their Lord. Neither had Jesus commissioned them and given them the authority to cast out demons as he did his disciples when he would send them out or his, his apostles. They, they essentially tried to use the name of Jesus as some sort of a, of a talisman or a magic charm, thinking that the demons would respect it. Well, certainly they would if the person who was using the name had the authority to use it. Now, we do need to remember that our enemy is a very powerful enemy. And we shouldn't trifle with him. We shouldn't play games with him. The devil may not attack us in exactly the same way that he did these men. But we can be sure that when we seek to do the Lord's work, that he is going to move against us to stop us however he can. Now, we shouldn't be afraid because our Lord is much stronger than the enemy. And he has given to us spiritual weapons of warfare. He's given to us spiritual armor. He's given to us spiritual weapons. And we need to equip ourselves with these things and know how to use them. And if we do, we will defeat him. I can't help but think, you know, at this point about, again, Pilgrim or Christian as he's on his way to Mount Zion. He goes to the valley of the shadow of death. He faces Apollyon. And as he's Facing him, he thinks about turning and running, but he realizes he has no armor for his backside, so he has to stand and face him. And it was, it was a hard battle. It wasn't easy to overcome him, but he was able to because he had the armor and he trusted in the Lord and he knew how uh, to use it. Okay? If we're not prepared, we should be afraid of the enemy because the Bible says he knows what our weaknesses are and he knows how to exploit them. And he can be very, very successful. If we're going to engage him in battle, we do need to use the armor, which, of course, we don't have time to review all of that tonight. But, again, we can overcome him. We do not need to be afraid. He will certainly try to make us afraid and cower, but we need to move forward. 
Now, that is what I want to say about spiritual warfare, but what we don't want to miss here is this, is how the Lord used that event to further His cause. Okay, Luke writes in verse 17, this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Well, what is it that became known to them? Well, certainly the miracles that were taking place by Paul, also the, the feet and the, you know, the, basically the, um, the pummeling that these seven men took at the hand of this demon, and the fact that this made a distinction. It showed them that Paul really was speaking from the Lord. You know, we might see these exorcists kind of like Pharaoh's magicians. Remember during the time of the Exodus. At, at the first part of that series of miracles that uh, the Lord did through Moses, whenever Moses did a miracle, the magicians would also do something very similar, and that would convince Pharaoh that there was really nothing special going on, that Moses is just some kind of magician or trickster. But when they failed to reproduce what Moses was able to do, Pharaoh and all Egypt became afraid. So when the Ephesians heard what had happened, um, that not only that Paul was able to fight against the demons and win, um, but that these others were not, they were afraid and began to honor the Lord Jesus. They began to honor His message. They began to respond to that message. And the result was that the Lord used these events to bring many people to Himself. We read in verse 18, many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. Uh, what Luke is telling us here is that there was a true work of grace going on in the hearts of these people. It was not just that they were afraid, but they, they truly believed. And with true conversion, there is true repentance. Notice that it begins with confession. You know, John reminds us in his first letter in 1 John 1, verses 9 and 10, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we say that we have not sinned. We make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. Those who receive God's grace confess their sins. And what that means is that they agree with God. They agree with His Word that what they have done is wrong. What they have done is sinful. What they have done is evil. But it's more than just confession. It's also a turning away from those sins. We read again in verse 19. And many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Remember when uh, John the Baptist uh, was preaching basically repentance, getting God's people ready for the coming of the Messiah, and he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, how to win friends and influence people, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, if you say you're repentant, show your repentance. Do what God calls you to do. Turn away from your sin and begin to do the right thing. Well, that's exactly what the Ephesians did. They realized the, their books were offensive to God, and so they burned them. You know, sometimes, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I hate to say it, but sometimes, you know, when we, we change our minds, you know, like on certain, certain things, and, um, you know, we, let's say we become a Christian and we've got all these other books. What do we do with these books? Well, Sometimes we, we give them away, sometimes we sell them because we, we can redeem some, some money, but realize that if, if the book contains something that other people shouldn't read as well, you shouldn't pass it on to somebody else who might potentially read it. These didn't try to sell the books, they didn't give them away because they realized that would only encourage other people to evil, instead they destroyed them so that no one else would be injured by them. You know, I can't help but think, too, that in the history of the church, there were lots of book burnings, and some of them were not so great. But there are times when books do need to be burned. 
And we read there were a lot of books that were brought. The value of the books they brought were 50,000 pieces of silver. And it just shows us how entrenched the Ephesians were in witchcraft. But it also shows the grace that the Lord was pouring out on them, that they would be willing to give up so much of these possessions in order to follow the Lord. Luke concludes with these words, so the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. So the miracles that the Lord did through Paul, the failure of the Jewish exorcists uh, to duplicate what he had done, and the fear the Lord brought on the Ephesians through that failure to duplicate and vindicating Paul, all worked together to justify the gospel. Now they were paying attention to it, and the Lord was making it powerful to save them. Now again, how do we apply this? Let me just say, just review what we've already seen. The Lord has given us different arguments to vindicate His truth, which is why we need to be ready to defend the gospel. But we also need to understand that He uses circumstances as well, doesn't He? To make people concerned enough to listen before he brings that truth savingly home. Now, we can't bring about those circumstances, but we can pray, and that's why we need to pray that the Lord would bring the situations that are needed in the lives of those that we are witnessing to and those that we care about that will get them to pay attention to his gospel. The Lord does work supernaturally to bring about the new birth. Without it, people aren't going to be saved. But we need to realize that He uses means to that end. And one of those means is awakening, right? He awakens them to their need. And that comes about through circumstances. And it's different for, for many people. So we need to pray that God might wake them up and get them to listen to what it is that He would have us uh, to bring to them. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to um, help us to remember these things, help us to be able to uh, put these things into practice.